Um, hello everybody and welcome to the first video in a series of videos which will be exploring um, theme fours 4.5. This is called the role of the state in the macro economy. Right now you can see here um, the direction of the next few videos that we're going to be putting together. This first one is looking at public expenditure, so 4.5.1. The next video, we'll look at taxation, and then we'll put it all together to look at public sector finances. OK, so this first video, we'll be looking at 4.5.1, which is about public expenditure. Right, everyone, first things first, and before we delve into public expenditure, it's worth noting that I've put together here on this slide the three videos that we'll be doing in this series of videos. This one's about public expenditure. Now, it's worth noting there are three different types of public expenditure. We've got transfer payments, capital expenditure, and current expenditure. We'll think about what these mean in a moment or two. Uh, we've then got taxation, which will be the next video. There are two main different types of taxes, direct and indirect. And we'll cover what they are when we get onto that particular topic. And then in the final one, we'll be looking at public sector borrowing. So um, how our government borrows money, the consequences of borrowing lots of money, and then maybe even start to think about how you might look to pay down um, debt that might have been built up as a government. OK, right. So let's think, first of all, then about public expenditure. Now, public expenditure is simply another name for government spending. So it is the spending that the government makes across our economy. Now, we have three different types of government spending capital expenditure, current expenditure, and transfer payments. Now, capital expenditure is public expenditure or government spending on long-term capital projects. So these are normally linked to supply-side policies designed to create potential economic growth. So these are the things that are designed in the long run to make the long-run aggregate supply curve move outwards. So we're normally looking here at infrastructure, so it could be building new hospitals, it could be building new motorway networks, it could be upgrading other infrastructure such as um, communications technology, building new schools, upgrading port facilities up and down the country. So anything linked to infrastructure, we would stick under the banner of capital expenditure. So the government investing into long term infrastructure projects. A really good example at the moment would be high speed two train lines costing the government tens of billions of pounds to upgrade the country's railway network. Now, current expenditure is more to do with the day-to-day -day running of the public sector. So when you think about the public sector, you think about the NHS, you think about um, education, so schools and colleges. We could be thinking about the police, other emergency services like the fire brigade, those types of things there. So current expenditure is looking at the funding of the day-to-day -day operations of the public sector. So paying the wages of doctors and teachers and nurses, police officers, paying for the resources those businesses use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it could be, for example, um, paying for the paper that you use, paying the electricity bill, the gas bill, paying for the cleaners to operate in the public, expend um, the public sector. Transfer payments um, is where the government are making payments to people without any exchange of output. So this is about paying people's state pensions. It could be about paying people's um, unemployment benefits, contributions towards um, working tax credits, family allowances, et cetera. So this is sort of welfare support from the government to households. And normally this is linked to trying to tackle inequality and poverty across an economy. OK, so three different types of government spending, capital expenditure, current expenditure and transfer payment. Now, just note to this at the bottom of this slide here, budget deficits. Now, hopefully what you remember is a budget deficit is where the level of government spending exceeds the level of taxation that comes into the government. So there was the spending more than what they get back in through taxes. Now, what we know is in Britain, our government operate with huge budget deficits. They've been trying to reduce these in recent years, and they've been to a certain extent successful with that. But due to COVID-19, those budget deficits have again shot up massively. Now, if we want to think about whether budget deficits are a good thing or a bad thing, there's just an argument here that I want you to think about. 
And this is something that we call intergenerational equity. Now, what we're thinking about here is with intergenerational equity is how what we do today is impacting on future generations. So if I forget about government financing for a moment or two, think about the environment. What we know is through our living today, we're building up environmental problems for the future. So our use of cars and airplanes today, it's created lots of carbon emissions, which could be really, really bad for future generations. In other words, our actions today are going to be creating bad impacts for your kids and your grandkids um, when they come into this world. Now, you could argue that budget deficits also create intergenerational equity problems. If our governments are having to borrow money to fund capital expenditure, current expenditure and transfer payments, then it's potentially creating an intergenerational equity problem. If our governments are borrowing money, we are asking your kids and their grandkids to pay our debt off. In other words, we're living today beyond our means and then expecting future generations to pay off this debt on our behalf. Now, you could argue this is completely unacceptable. In particular, if we've got a budget deficit due to current expenditure and transfer payments. Now, the rationale behind that is um, current spending, funding the NHS, the education systems, etc., giving people benefits is benefiting people directly today. So we're having all the benefits of that money, but then we're expecting people in the future to pay that debt off for us. So to maintain and improve our living standards today, we're expecting people in the future to accept lower living standards. Now, you could argue, though, that budget deficits could be acceptable if they are being run due to high levels of capital expenditure. And the reason being, if we're upgrading transport infrastructure, upgrading road networks and building new hospitals and schools, then they will benefit future generations. So they're making a contribution towards the infrastructure that they can benefit from. So, guys, the whole idea behind intergenerational equity is this idea that budget deficits could be seen as acceptable if they have been used to fund capital expenditure. And that is because people in the future will benefit from those. But if they're being used to fund current expenditure and transfer payments, then it's unacceptable because people in the future will not really benefit from those. Right now, I've just chucked at you a fair amount of theory. So what I would now like you to do is to think about this overall question. So A, um, what do we mean by the following types of public expenditure or government spending? Try and put down some examples for each one. B, what is the budget deficit? And then C, what do we mean by the term intergenerational equity? And then think about the follow-up question for that. Why is the budget deficit to fund capital expenditure seem to be more acceptable than a budget deficit that might be used to fund current expenditure? So what I want you to now do is to hit pause, write down your answers, and when you're comfortable with this theory, hit play, and we'll move on with the rest of the video. So hit pause now, please. Right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, what we're now going to be thinking about with public spending or public expenditure, government spending, whatever you want to call it, is what will affect the size and the composition of public spending. Now, the size refers simply to how much government spending takes place, whereas the composition will refer to what public money is spent on. So what we're looking at here is, well, what will dictate how much the government chooses to spend but also what will dictate what the government chooses to spend money on. Now, you've got here lots of different things that we could talk about. Let's think about incomes, first of all. Now, what you might argue is that if incomes are falling across the economy, maybe due to a recession, then it could mean there's a greater need for expansionary fiscal policy. And that could mean there's a growing need for more public expenditure. So the idea would be there that if you're in a recession and we need to help the economy grow, there might be a need for an increase in the size of government expenditure. Now, you could also argue that might affect what we spend money on as well. If we're in a recession and incomes are falling, there might be a growing need for the government to increase spending on things such as unemployment benefits and other forms of welfare to guard against things such as poverty. Now, the next one, I put age or the distribution of age, so how old people are across the economy. 
demographics. Now, you would argue that if you've got a growing elderly population, the composition of public spending would move towards more healthcare to look after those people who are elderly, but also more pensions. So that would clearly affect the composition of public spending. Um, you would also argue as well that if you've got a growing young population, so more children come into the system, the composition would move towards more education, family allowances. So we would be changing and adjusting what we spend money on based on the age of the population. Next one, expectations, uh, down to what people believe the government should be spending money on. So with COVID-19, for example, the expectation is that more money is spent on helping businesses survive um, lockdowns. But also there's an expectation that more money will be spent on healthcare to um, help people you know, fight COVID-19, raise chances of survival, but then also rolling out the vaccine afterwards. So that would clearly affect the size and the composition of public spending. Due to COVID-19, there's an expectation that more money will be spent by the government, you know, furlough schemes, that type of thing, healthcare, helping governments, but also the composition will change. So more money going towards those services that need more money to fight COVID-19. The next one I put business cycle. Now we've already talked about this one really with incomes. What you'd expect is that when you're in recessions, when unemployment is high, there'll be a growing need for more government spending. But then when unemployment is low, there'll be less need for government spending. Um, interest on national debt. Now, what you might argue is if interest rates on national debt are really, really low, that should lead to a growth in the size of government spending. It could even mean there's a growing need for more spending on infrastructure. If interest is low on national debt, it could be a really, really good time to borrow to upgrade infrastructure. Inflation as well. If you've got high inflation, you could argue there's a growing need to raise unemployment benefits for households, um, raise pensions, increase wages of public sector workers. Um, it could come down to political priorities. So you, you tend to find that um, if a government comes into power and their focus is on tackling poverty and inequality, that could lead to a growing need for government spending. Um, if government's coming and their focus is on promoting free market economics, there might be a government trying to spend less on government spending and promote the idea of market forces. And then clearly the final one, the state of the global economy. If the global economy is struggling, there could be a growing need for more government spending. If poor countries across the world are struggling financially, there could be a growing need for our government to increase spending on um, helping developing economies tackle these big financial problems they might be facing. Well, that could lead to a growing need for um, financial aid to these poor countries across the world. Right, everyone, you've now got another um, pause question. So again, I want you to jot down your answers for these questions, please. So A, um, explain the difference between the size and the composition of public spending. You've got some definitions on the previous slide to help you with this one. And then B, explain three reasons why the size or the level of government spending may need to increase. C, um, explain three reasons why the size of or the level of government spending might need to fall. Try and make these points unrelated to the ones that you mentioned in B. And then D, explain a range of possible reasons why the composition of government spending may need to change. So guys, hit pause now, put down your answers for these questions. And when you're happy and you understand these answers, hit play again. Right guys, so hit pause now. Right everyone, welcome back. Now what we're gonna do in these next couple of slides is to think about the impacts on the economy of growing levels of public expenditure. And we're going to be thinking about what is good about more public expenditure and what could be bad about more public expenditure. Right, now, first of all, let's think about the impacts on productivity and growth. So I'm thinking here about the output per worker, so how efficiently people produce goods and services, but also the GDP level in the economy. Now, what you would argue then, first of all, if there's a growth in government spending, well, that should ultimately improve productivity. And think about why. If we're increasing current expenditure to upgrading things like healthcare and education, that would upgrade human capital. So people become more skilled and therefore become more productive. Well, that could create export-led growth due to increasing our 
international competitiveness. Now, if we're also ex uh, spending more on capital expenditure, that would mean that physical capital improves. So I'm looking now at the road networks, the transport links up and down the country, um, other essential infrastructure such as communications technology. Well, if all those things are improving, that should again improve productivity. Now, you could think about what that would do. If you've got better transport links, it might tackle things like um, geographical immobility of labour. So firms can access better skilled and more productive workers. Now, what all this um, spending on, ca on capital and current expenditure should do, it should literally crowd in private investment. Now, what I mean by that is if you were to upgrade um, the quality of workers and the quality of the infrastructure of the economy, that should attract more foreign firms and more domestic firms to want to invest into our economy. If they want to access and make use of them really, really efficient, high skilled resources, they've got to invest into our economy. Well, that should create more jobs and economic growth and therefore more exports on the back of all of this. Now, there is a bit of a problem, though, that when you increase government spending too much, we're expanding the size of what we call the public sector. It was the government are interfering and manipulating the economy more than what they ever have done before. And that is reducing the role of private enterprise. Now, private enterprises thrive on the idea of the profit motive. They're in it to make profit. If the government are doing more and more, they're spending more in the economy, there's less opportunities for private firms to get involved. And this could lead to what we call X inefficiency. In other words, inefficient spending. We're preventing the growth of the private sector because the public sector are hogging all of the resources of the country. Now, the next one, living standards. Well, what you would argue is if there's more um, public expenditure going on, then it should lead to better living standards. And think about why. If you've got more current expenditure, it means that people can access better education, better healthcare. If they're getting higher benefits through transfer payments, then their incomes are increasing. Well, think about the Human Development Index. If we give people more money, if we upgrade healthcare and education, there'll be an improvement in the Human Development Index score. Further to that as well, if we were to upgrade capital expenditure, then that people can make use of better infrastructure, get better jobs, access more merit goods like edu education and healthcare, and that will clearly improve living standards. But there is a potential problem for this as well. Um, if we were to increase public expenditure, it could mean that taxes have had to increase. Well, that could be a problem for people, you know, if they're paying more taxes, it might lower disposable incomes. But also, if it's going to be increasing national debt, then we've got that issue of intergenerational equity problems. It might be storing up debt repayment problems for future generations. Right, everyone, now building on this, um, we've now got to think about something that we call the crowding out argument. Now, this is a potential problem of too much public spending. In other words, the problems of the government spending too much in the economy. Now, the first problem is something that we call resource crowding out. Now, look at this production possibility frontier. On the vertical axis, I've got private sector spending. That is spending by private businesses, profit-making companies. On the horizontal axis, I've got public sector spending. Now, look what happens. If the government starts to spend more across the economy, they're going to be hogging more of the resources of the, of the country. They're taking more of the workers of the country, more of the land and capital and enterprise resources. Now, what we're doing here, we are moving from A to B on this production possibility frontier. Logic is, if the government hogs more and more of the country's resources to fund things like the NHS and education, there's less ability for the private sector to grow. They are literally hogging more of the resources of the country. Well, that is preventing the private sector from growing. So the idea is it's crowding out private sector investment. By taking all the resources of the public sector, there are fewer resources available for the private sector to grow. So think about it logically. The NHS expands, the hockey more of the country's doctors and nurses. Well, that prevents private medical companies like Bupa from expanding because they can't get hold of the resource, resources that they, they need to grow. Now, we can also think about this as financial crowding out. Crowding out. 
This is linked to when governments increase spending, it could mean that more borrowing has had to take place. Now, what that will mean is that more bonds have to be created to um, raise the funds to fund the extra government spending. Now, the idea would be if more money goes into bonds, it means there's less money to lend to households and firms across the economy. So if the government are hogging all the money of the economy, there's less funds available for you and me to borrow. There's less funds for businesses to borrow. And again, that is stopping the growth of businesses from growing if they cannot access the money they need to grow. It is worth noting, though, that we can also think about the crowding in argument. If governments do increase public spending and it's upgrading infrastructure and human capital, then that could create a better environment for businesses to want to expand and move into as well. So it, it does kind of go two ways, that one. Right, guys, next slide. Um, impacts of high levels of public expenditure on taxes. Now, we've got to assume if there's more public expenditure taking place, then there's going to have to be more taxes. So the direct consequence of more public expenditure will mean at some point in the future, taxes will have to go up. Next one, equality. Uh, the assumption would be, everyone, that if there's more public expenditure, then society will become more equal. And that is because you tend to find that public expenditure will generally benefit um, lower income households more than higher income households. And think about why. If there's more transfer payments, we're raising the benefits that low income households receive. Well, that guards those people against absolute poverty and makes society more equal. But also, if there's more funding on current and capital expenditure, it will mean that lower income households can access more education, more healthcare, and therefore upgrade their human capital. Well, that allows them to move into better paid work. Um, also, upgrading current and capital expenditure will also tackle geographical and occupational immobility of labour. So we're therefore raising the opportunities of low income people to fulfil their potential. Right, guys, now just to bring all this together, I want you to think about question three. Now look at A, explain the potential benefits of an increase in government spending. I want you to talk about why an increase in government spending should improve both productivity and growth. Why in theory it should improve living standards. I want to explain why more government spending could crowd in private investment, sort of how it could help grow the private sector. And then I want you to think about how, in theory, more public spending should improve equality. So know why it should mean that the Lorenz curve should start to shift inwards over time. Why it should mean that absolute and relative poverty rate should start to fall. Now I've labelled the next one A, but it should be B. Explain the potential drawbacks of that increase in public expenditure. So explain why more public spending could lead to lower productivity and growth. You might be really clever in tying things such as moral hazard. Um, you could talk about the crowding out argument. I then want you to talk about, in theory, why more public expenditure might be quite bad for living standards. So you could talk about why it could lead to higher taxes or intergenerational equity problems, how it could prevent people from wanting to go out and get work and earn more money. Talk about um, the crowding out argument. You could talk about financial crowding out and resource crowding out. And then finally, on this question, uh, why it would lead to more taxes in the future. And then finally, everyone, you've got this question at the bottom of the page. What do you think are the potential impacts on the economy of a reduction in public expenditure? So, what you might think about is what is good about reducing public spending but also what is bad about reducing public expenditure. Right, guys, um, hit pause now, please, and answer these questions. And once you've answered these questions, you have reached the end of this video. Thank you very much.